Ford has cranked up the perpetual motion bullshit machine once again (laughs) in celebration of the upcoming deployment of the electric transit custom, the so-called e-transit custom. So in this report, I'm going to decompile and reverse engineer the cat that is thus far out of the bag so that you can start considering whether or not the e-transit custom might be the right tradie or courier vehicle for you. Logan from AutoExpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap. (laughs) Australia only. Website. Card. Now, I've got to read you the headline, dude. I really do, because this is what passes for clever in automotive PR. All new, all electric e-transit custom set to (coughs) spark the EV revolution for Australian Small business. Now, to me, that just reads like the script for a spruker at a strip club up the cross, you know, crack of dawn, the meat society, or head in the clouds kind of thing. Anywho, the vehicle is here, and I'm going to break it all down for you and see what falls out. And today's pointer du jour, do I have a treat for you? It's the (coughs) Excision Magnetic Swarf Wand. Properly Jedi. It's a first for this channel, too. That was almost a King Arthur moment now that I think about it. All right, so Ford has this plan for EVs in Australia, which is basically five of them by the end of 2024. So they've got some time to roll it out, and we'll have to endure the endless PR prick teasing, I'd suggest. So We do know, as a result of last week's press release, that the e-transit custom is part of that plan. So it's going to be here between now and the end of the year after next. Be still, my beating heart. But I'm not just going to trash talk them. There is actually a compelling case, at least seemingly, based on what we know so far, for some modes of use for this van. And EVs and courier vans and things of that nature, they kind of go together because... Clean air in the city is such an important topic, dude. Like, the number of people that pollution from internal combustion kills based on, you know, just ingesting it, breathing it in in our cities is huge. And EVs that do a lot of running in the city is obviously combustion that is not happening in the city. And I know you can make the case that EVs, if you fire them up with coal, literally are really remote combustion vehicles, but at least millions of people are not breathing that exhaust. So there's that. Okay, the first thing I noted from their release is this quote about next generation battery tech, okay? It's actually the batteries out of the F-150 Lightning, so there is no next generation battery tech, you know? It's all the current generation lithium ion battery tech, and terms like this are really an intelligence test or a scientific literacy test, okay? Basically, this kind of thing is an insult to all of the diligent researchers who go into R&D facilities and universities and things of that nature and just try and tweak the existing tech so that we get a better balance of power delivery and endurance over time for batteries. Like the periodic table of elements is known and electrolytes are all known and there really is no imminently deployable next generation battery tech on the horizon that's just fusion power dude it's like five to ten years away and it's going to be five to ten years away for the rest of my friggin life that's just how this works okay what they're saying about the transit custom however is 74 kilowatt hours of battery delivering up to 380 kilometres of range on the World Harmonised Light Test Procedure cycle. That's the new one, which has been kind of in use since about 2017, I think. It's a bit better than the old one, the NEDC one, but it's still not perfectly aligned with the real world. So you just have to take that with a grain of salt and you really have to think about what that means for you if you use a van or a ute, okay? 
11 kilowatts DC, they say, full recharge in seven hours and 12 minutes, which is kind of overnight. So if you're a tradie and you take your van home and you've got three phase power because you can only get 11 kilowatts out of three phase power because the limit for single phase is like 230 volts at 32 amps, which is 7.4, I think, kilowatts anyway. So you need three phase to do this overnight, but I wish manufacturers would just figure out a better way, instead of bullshitting about next generation battery tech, why don't they just concentrate on better thermal management of the inverter for charge, okay? Because if they did that, instead of bullshitting about this, you could have 22 kilowatts of DC because that's the maximum power delivery of three phase power. 32 amps per phase, okay, is three times 7.4 is 22 kilowatts. And so many EVs, like current EVs, current generation EVs, are locked into 11 kilowatts DC. And I think this pertains to Ionic 5, EV6, the recently facelifted just last week, MG ZS EV and also this baby and by extension the Ford Lightning I guess I don't know I'd have to do actual research for that so if you've only got single phase at home and you come back sort of dead empty and you need to be fully topped up the next day you will need to be on the charger for about 11 hours with single phase power Okay, so that's all something for you to consider. Once you start getting more than about high 50s or early 60s in battery, single phase, even fast charging is going to take some time if you come back empty. And that might be the case if you are a private courier type contractor. You go out, you do your run, you deliver your boxes, whatever. You get home, battery's going to be sucking on a dry tank. You're going to need to fill it up. Single phase power. You're going to need to be home with that van for 11 hours between shifts on the charger. Otherwise, no can do tomorrow, dude. And here's the bit where we start our reverse engineering, starting with what we learned last week about the e-transit custom and what we already know about similar, in some ways, vehicles already deployed and what inferences we can draw between them and try and get a bit more information on the table to help you. Okay, so we know the e-transit custom has a 74 kilowatt hour battery. We know it goes 380 kilometers according to the new test cycle. We know it delivers 160 kilowatts peak and and 415 newton meters peak, which is not all that dissimilar to the Hyundai Ionic 5, although obviously they're very dissimilar vehicles in terms of their application. But on fundamentals, not so different. 72.6 kilowatt hours, which is almost line ball, a bit further in the range. And this has got to be because the new cycle runs the vehicles up to 130 kilometers an hour, and aerodynamics are going to be a factor there. So there's that. We know the tear weight because it's in every specification table you ever read. And the power is line ball at 160 kilowatts and slightly less peak torque, which also means slightly less mid-range power for the Ionic 5. And what we can do with Ionic 5 is we can ballpark the number of kilowatt hours of battery you need to take a ton of Ionic 5 100 kilometers. Okay, that's useful because we can then apply that to the e-transit custom and try and reverse engineer its likely tear mass. So what we do is we get our 72.6 and we divide it by 4.51 lots of 100 Ks and we divide it by 2.02 tons and the number that falls out on our lap is eight. That's eight kilowatt hours of battery to take one ton 100 kilometers, all right? And then we can apply that to the E-Transit and the E-Transit custom to get the tear weight, and you just rearrange this and plug in the different numbers, 74, 3.8, and our magic number of eight, that likely tear mass, 2.4 tons, okay? And that compares quite favorably to the petrol one, the petrol transit custom, 320S Sport, the short wheelbase auto one, is 2,000 kilos, roughly, in tear weight. And the difference, obviously, between internal combustion and battery is generally in that four to 500 kilogram ballpark. So I'd say we're on the money here at about 2.4 tonnes. One of the most important considerations
is often the payload. What can you carry in that sucker, right? Because you don't want to drive around with a dead empty. You've got to have a business case, okay? The payload is going to be very important to most users. And Ford's statement from last week's release is no compromise, load carrying and capability, all right? No compromise, well, in terms of capability, like except for range, come on. But no compromise in terms of load carrying means the payload has to be a thousand kilos, right? Otherwise, they're just not in the game. They're not directly comparable with the petrol equivalent, okay? So the gross vehicle mass of this vehicle is going to be 3.4 tons, of which a thousand kilos is payload, just to recap, payload is not just the crap you carry, it's you and your stuff and any accessories you fit, your roof rack, whatever, right? And the stuff you carry in the back, okay? Very important to realize that it's not a ton of stuff in the back. If you're a ton of stuff in the back and 100 kilos of you with a briefcase, whatever, like, dude, you're overloaded. So there's that. So I looked at these two likely usage cases, okay? You've got your courier case, which is a bit more complex. We'll get to that in just a second. But you've also got a usage case that I would categorize as the tradie hoarder. Okay, now, I love you tradies. I really do, because I have great admiration for good tradies. I've always had that. When I trained as an engineer, I was amazed at the stuff a good tradie can do in the tool room, like with a mill. They can play it like a friggin' Stradivarius, okay? So I'm not having a shot at tradies, although I am having a shot at this particular operational characteristic of tradies, which is it doesn't matter how big the van is, dude. You fill it up with this shit, right? You just do. So the tradie hoarder is going to have his angle grinder that's only got a dodgy bearing in it from 1984, and he hasn't used it since, but one day, one day, it might come in handy, okay? And he's operating that thing at the GVM, right, at 3.4 tonnes. So we'll look at that usage case, and then we'll look at your courier, which is a bit more complex mathematically if you want to model it in a meaningful way. But I'd say you've got to allow 150 kilos for a human and accessories, and esky with lunch in it or whatever, drink, you know, laptop, whatever you do in your van, in addition to carrying crap. Let's say it's 150 kilos of that crap and 850 kilos for deliverables, right? And deliverables is a really interesting concept because the van gets lighter along the run, doesn't it, okay? So let's say that this 850 goes to zero, over the duration of the run to deliver all those boxes, that means the average load during the run is 425 plus 150 kilos for you and your shit and your accessories in your car, in your van, right? So that means the average load in the van is 575 kilos. So let's call it 600, which means 24 plus 600 equals three tons, okay? And we'll look at how those two usage cases play out in the real world, because that's going to impact dramatically on how far you can go with your van. So let's talk about the range in relation to the courier, okay? If you take our magic equation and rearrange it slightly, the range falls out. So what we do is we get our battery and we divide it by our tons and we multiply the bottom line by our magic number of eight kilowatt hours per ton per 100 k's. And the range that falls out that relates to the new test cycle is 308 Ks. Not 380, which Ford claims, but 308 with a load on board because obviously the load affects the range. And that's what we're doing here. We're compensating for that. So this is not the end of the story either, incidentally, because the new cycle is better aligned with the real world, but it's certainly not Goldilocks in terms of its alignment. And it would be prudent to take 20% off that to relate the WLTP version to what's more likely in the real world. And if we do that and take the 20% off, we're talking about 250 Ks of range. This is not the end of the story though, because Ford talks about recharging with a DC fast charger of 124 kilowatts and recharging from 15% to 80% in 41 minutes. And they're gonna try and sell that to you as a lunch break, okay? And that makes sense, that's a decent lunch break. You could tolerate that, certainly, particularly if you're saving money on fuel, I suppose. If you do that, and you go from 15 to 80%, you've no longer got 100% of the battery to exploit. You've got to knock 35% of this off, and if you do that, 
you're down to 160 kilometers, which is fine, I suppose, if you can find that Goldilocks 124 kilowatt charger or greater at that Goldilocks location on your run at that Goldilocks time of lunchtime. In fairness to Ford, they've also got this front loading capability built into the whole charging algorithm where you can just pull in like a pit stop to your fast charger if it's 124 kilowatts and you can jam in, according to their claim, you could jam in 38 k's of range in just five minutes. So if you're not quite going to get home or not going to quite get back to base at the end of your run, that could be pretty useful, I'd suggest. But still, you do need a lot of things to line up in order to utilise this vehicle efficiently as a courier. If we look at the Trady Hoarder, though, things are a lot simpler for the Trady Hoarder because he's fully loaded the whole time, dude. He can't throw anything away. And the numbers that fall out related to the World Harmonised Test Cycle, right, 272 Ks versus 308 because he's more heavily loaded on average, and if you uh, align that with the real world, you get 218 kilometres. And if you take your 15 to 80 into consideration, knock 35% off, you're at 141 k's. And I suggest this lines up a lot better for some tradies because many tradies go from their home to a building site and they spend most of the day there and they come home again, right? And even if that's right across town, like 40 k's of commuting or something, you're still only using 80 k's there and back and you can recharge overnight. And even if you've got to duck out to some supplier to pick up some screws or some GPOs or whatever, you're still not going to blow your 141 k's of range and you're not going to need to recharge at all during the day for many tradies. It's different if you're a service dude and you've got to fix, you know, 14 stoves today all over town. You're more like a courier, dude. So... The other consideration, I guess, is there's a third usage case which is even more obvious, and that might be you if you largely use your van as a runaround for your business. Like the dude next to me over at the other fat cave. He's in the food industry. He's got retail premises and a factory, and he's got a van, and he seems to use it with one or two people in it and very little staff, although it is quite useful for him for running around doing this and that from time to time. That van spends most of its life stopped at one of those two locations, or his home, presumably, and at the two industrial locations, he'd have three-phase power, so he could plug it into single-phase or three-phase, it'd be charged up most of the time, and if it's not, he could get enough to get home, he can just plug it in at home, which is fairly local, because small business, right? So... For a dude of that nature, whom you might also be, the e-transit custom or a vehicle like that might be a no-brainer, mightn't it? Because it's the easiest one to make sure that it's, you know, more than reasonably charged for the next few foreseeable driving steps. Anyway, I hope this has gone some way to making it easier for you to cut through all of the noise and the perpetual motion bullshit and actually consider carefully based on the facts whether or not an e-van might be the next step up in vehicles for you.